Welcome to the webinar on inflammation in Parkinson's disease. My name is Patrick Brunden. I am in Grand Rapids in Michigan at the Van Andel Institute. And this webinar has a group of very esteemed participants and contributors. Uh, before I introduce them, I just want to say that the webinar has been made possible through a joint effort by the Cure Parkinson's Trust, Parkinson's Movement, and Journal of Parkinson's Disease. And you will see that there are three other people uh, in the panel. They'll be answering the questions I will be moderating. And I see them and you will see them as they speak. Maybe we could have Rochelle Flanagan say something so we can see you. Hi there. Rochelle is muted. Here, here we are. Here's <laughs> Rochelle. So Rochelle uh, is from Ireland and Rochelle has Parkinson's disease, but she's also somewhat of an expert on diet, if I'm not mistaken. Well, I, I, that's what I'm trained in. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Glad you, Glad to Rochelle. be here. Thanks for inviting me. And the second participant, participant we have is Dr. Ashley Harms. Can you say hi so we can Hello. see you? Hello. Nice to meet you all. So Ashley Harms has been doing research on inflammation in Parkinson's disease and models of Parkinson's disease for many years. She runs her own group at the University of Alabama in Birmingham. That's correct. And we're delighted you are here too. And finally, we have a face some of you may recognize, a previous participant in these webinars, Dr. Roger Barker from Cambridge University. Hello, I'm back again. Uh... I'm uh, very pleased to be part of uh, uh, this uh, discussion on inflammation, which is uh, very topical at the moment. And those of you who know Roger will say that Roger is a clinical neurologist. That is true, but he's also an expert in some of the more experimental studies in Parkinson's. And in this context, I think he would be contributing a little bit about new therapies that might be targeting inflammation and what kind of promise they show or don't show, as the case may be. Everybody listening, you have the opportunity to ask questions. We got some questions before the webinar. We're going to try to address some of those. And if you look at the window, there is a Q&A uh, box that you can open, and there you can type your questions. We will be trying to answer most of them, but we know from experience we will not be able to address all of them. And then we will get back to you after the webinar and try to email some answers to everyone. All right, I'm gonna kick off with the first question, which I think is very important. Uh, it's just to kind of set the scene and, and make us understand what is inflammation? And is there any differences in inflammatory responses in people with Parkinson's and other people? And I thought, Ashley, maybe you could introduce this. Uh, yes, thank you so much for the question. Um, this is great because it's kind of setting the tone for this particular webinar. So um, in terms of inflammation, we're talking about the immune system. So everybody has one. And normally there's three main responses that your immune system is required for. So the first is kind of clearance of pathogens and viruses. So when we get sick or we get a bacterial infection, it's the response of your immune system that takes care of these pathogens, it removes it, and, and then shuts down. Uh, the second is for your immune system is also responsible for removing dead and dying cells within tissues, whether it be your liver or your brain or other areas. And then finally, inflammation is also defined as, in some cases in which we are thinking with, with Parkinson's in particular, it's excessive activation of your immune system. So it's kind of a misguided recognition, similar to that kind of seen in cancer where your immune system is responding to cells that are in pathogens as well as um, proteins in your body that are normally there, but in some cases may be modified and your immune system is hypervigilant at finding these and, and shutting it down or getting rid of them. So in terms of the central nervous system, which is your brain and your spinal cord, um, neuroinflammation is kind of defined as all of these responses must be taking place either simultaneously or working together. So when you think of neuroinflammation in the brain and spinal cord or central nervous system in the case of Parkinson's, 
you want to see infiltration of all different types of immune cells. So your immune system has two main working components. It has the innate immune system, which kind of does those first responses of clearance of pathogens and removing of dead and dying cells. But then it's also responsible for activating your adaptive immune system, which is a very tailored response to a particular protein or pathogen. And that usually involves T or B cells. Uh, those are the particular cell types that are in, involved in that response. So could so I ask you a question, Ashley? Sure. Sorry for interrupting. So, no, please do. So when it comes to the adaptive immune system, uh, obviously a topic that many people are discussing this week is the coronavirus. What's the difference here? Do we have an adaptive immune system that is primed for the coronavirus or not? And um, um, what is the issue there? <laughs> Well, I think that the adaptive immune system is, may or may not necessarily be prepped for specific viral responses, but that's what you need in order to shut down these viral responses. So um, a large portion of your CD8 T cell, so that's a specific type of T cell is required for shutting down viral responses. And so kind of getting back to the question about Parkinson's is that we know in the brain there are infiltration of these adaptive immune cells that occur in Parkinson's as well as atypical Parkinson's and that these particular cells are there, they are responding and they are there in excessive numbers. So in terms of defining neuroinflammation and inflammation in general, you wanna see participation of both innate cells, which are like microglia and macrophages, and you wanna see infiltration of these adaptive immune cells as well. So I think that you know perhaps a person with Parkinson's and what may set Parkinson's apart from others is that you know these particular proteins that are involved in Parkinson's may be misrecognized by the immune system, and there's certainly research to support this idea that you know inflammation, neuroinflammation is occurring in the brain and spinal cord of place patients with Parkinson's as well as um, in the periphery. So those those changes can be detected in both blood and as well as cerebrospinal fluid that surrounds the brain. So I remember back in the late 80s, there was a seminal paper that described there were these microglia in the brain of people yes. with Parkinson's. And, and back in those days, we were just saying, okay, those cells are there because they're cleaning up the debris from the cells that have died due to Parkinson's. And isn't it fair to say over the last 30 years, we've changed our view that perhaps they are not just there cleaning up the mess left behind by something else, but perhaps the immune cells are an integral response that leads to cell death and contributes to cell death. Oh, absolutely. I would 100% say that. So I, I think that the original observations were that the microglia, which are those innate immune cells that reside in the brain, they were responding to dead or dying neurons that had happened in, in the basal ganglia and Parkinson's disease. But now all of the research that we particularly do in animal models as well as others have shown that they are really important communicators of linking the peripheral immune system with the, the central nervous system, the brain's immune system. So it's not necessarily just the response of the microglia proliferating, like becoming more abundant and responding to dead or dying neurons. It's also important that they communicate with these T cells and B cells through all of these different signaling molecules that I'm sure we will talk about later in this webinar. It's also clear from what you've said, the immune system, of course, is very important. It does a lot of good things for us. It's oh, absolutely. You must have one. <laughs> so kind of what we were thinking in Parkinson's is perhaps maybe it is activated and has a difficulty shutting down, or there's a lot of evidence looking at Parkinson's as an age-related disorder, and, and the immune system, how it functions, can change drastically with age. So there's kind of a, a lot of different ideas at play and how the immune system is responding to these different antigens, such as alpha nuclein, which I'm sure we will talk about later, and, and how that changes with age and disease status. Well, that was a great introduction. Thank you. So I've already seen a couple of questions come in, and we're going to get to those later. I'm keeping my eye on the screen to see what we might answer. But I thought we'd go on to one of the uh, predetermined questions first. And this one I'd like to direct to you, Roger, and it's related to what kind of drugs might we use uh, to um, 
treat Parkinson's if it turns out that inflammation is as important as we believe it is now? And is it potentially an advantage to find now what we call a therapeutic target in an area where there already are many drugs that were designed for other diseases? Yeah. Inflammatory diseases. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very good question. I mean, I think, you know, the, the discussion before has been very helpful because as with you, when I was sort of growing up in this field, inflammation was seen as secondary to the problem. So targeting inflammation was a bit of a waste of time. The damage occurred. It was clearing away the damage. Why bother targeting it? But as Ashley so eloquently put, if it's a primary driver of the disease process or at least contributes to the disease process, then it's very tractable. And it's very tractable because we have a lot of drugs which we currently use in the clinic to treat inflammation. I think the more difficult question in Pug's disease is, you know, where is that inflammation and what does that inflammation consist of? So is this really something that's largely driven in the brain, in which case we need to give drugs which will get into the brain and stop inflammation in the brain? Is this a systemic disorder? You know, in the way that people now think about cancer, it's not cancer of the bowel, it's not cancer of the breast, it's a cancer of the whole body with a focus at one site. So you have to target the whole body. So is Parkinson's disease a disease of the whole body, which has a predilection for affecting nerves in the brain and perhaps the gut, and therefore giving systemic agents to damp down inflammation or change inflammation would work as effectively as anything that's targeting inflammation in the brain. So that is, you know, those questions I would say are slightly unresolved. Uh, it's very tractable, as I say, because there are lots of drugs out there. Then I think the critical question is, if you decide how to take this forward, do you take a very selective approach? So for many people who have diseases which are caused by self-inflammation, if you like, rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, these sort of disorders, initially they used to be treated with sort of drugs that had a very broad spectrum. So they would take out all the cells to some extent that Ashley was talking about. They were rather indiscriminate in the way that they suppressed the immune response. But people have become more refined and say, actually, we're going to give antibody therapies now. So we're going to give you a therapy that specifically targets a particular chemical, which is released by immune cells, TNF alpha antibodies, or we're going to target a particular type of T cell with an antibody. Now, obviously, the beauty of that is it's a very specific treatment, but it does work on the assumption that that effect of that molecule, that cell, is the thing that's driving the disease. And if you target that, it will slow down the disease. Whereas it could be in poxies, it's a little bit of B cells, it's a little bit of T cells, it's a little bit of macrophage, a little bit of monocytes. There's a whole group of cells that are contributing and therefore broad approaches would be better. Could I interrupt you there? Sorry, but in that context, do you think there might be differences between different people with Parkinson's? Some people who have inherited genetic forms could potentially have a disturbance in a specific pathway. Uh, others who have other genetic forms or the more sporadic forms would yeah, I, th I think it, well, disturbed another country. There are more expert people on this than me. I would say that there probably are. So I think LARC2, for example, there's quite a lot of evidence that LARC2 has rather specific effects. So that's a particular form of mm -hmm. uh, Parkinsonism and Parkinson's disease. So that may have a particular inflammatory signature, if you like. I think some of the other forms which will be related to, say, problems in the alpha-synuclein pathway will be a response to alpha-synuclein. So it might be the same in those families as you would see in people with sporadic disease. Now, I think there are two elements to it. One is obviously the response to the, whatever's driving the immune response. So in this case, alpha-synuclein. And as you say, probably different people respond in different ways because some people develop rheumatoid arthritis, some people develop inflammatory bowel disease, some people develop celiac disease. They all have a slightly different immune system which has some genetic basis, which allows them to respond in a certain way to whatever pathogen it is to drive the disease process. So one could imagine in Parkinson's disease, we all have a particular background immune responsiveness. We get exposed to a protein causing the disease in some way, alpha-synuclein, and how we react to that as a function of age, as well as Ashley was saying, determines how the disease progresses. I wouldn't say it instigates the disease myself, but I would say it definitely is a, a component driving the disease process. And that obviously has therapeutic implications, as you were saying at the beginning, because if we can slow down the inflammation, which is presumably causing damage in the brain, which is leading to worsening Parkinson's disease, you could slow down the whole disease process in people. But I think that will be different in different people. And so one of the challenges is not only deciding what agent to use to target which bit of the immune response, but who of the people with Parkinson's disease would you start to treat in the first place?
So could you mention an agent? I know you are part of a trial at the moment with a drug that affects the immune system. Just give us an example why you've chosen this. And what yeah, well, it's not my trial. It's uh, uh, Caroline Williams Gray is actually in the office next door. Uh, <laughs> she uh, has done a trial with uh, a drug called azathioprine. And the rationale for this trial is that azathioprine is a drug which basically suppresses the immune system. It's not particularly uh, discreet in where it's targeting. It rather, has rather a diffuse effect on the immune system. The reason for choosing it is for that reason. It targets lots of areas. It works very well in the periphery. You can monitor whether it has an effect on the immune system. Uh, it's been used for years in people with neurological problems of other types. So we have a lot of experience with it. And what Caroline's uh, um, doing in this trial is not only using this agent to see whether it actually suppresses the immune response in people with Parkinson's disease in the periphery, uh, which you would expect, but is choosing people who look to have a disease where inflammation is more of a player than in patients where they, they don't. So data from studies we've done would suggest that people who produce more of an immune response in the early stages uh, have a more activated immune system tend to progress more quickly. Therefore, we're so you select. measure this in the blood or you could well you measure it in the blood and that's a sort of surrogate marker of what you think might be going on in the brain. But that is an assumption. Mm. So the idea is if you take people who have more inflammation in their blood, they seem to progress more quickly. That's based on studies which we did where we took people and followed them over time. We didn't give them any drugs. We just took blood when they first presented to their doctor. We saw those that had more inflammation in their blood when we looked at them three years later had done less well. So we made a sort of an association between it, but to prove that they're causally linked, i.e. more inflammations makes your disease get worse, you have to intervene. So the idea is to stop the inflammation in this case with azathioprine. So earlier on in your answer, Roger, you mentioned luck to one of the genes that is associated with Parkinson's. In fact, the most common of the inherited monogenetic forms mm -hmm. is luck 2 mutations. And it's interesting because that gene has also been implicated in inflammatory bowel disease. And I thought, Rochelle, maybe I could bring you in here. There is a link between inflammatory bowel disease and Parkinson's. And people with inflammatory bowel disease have an elevated risk, albeit relatively small, but still an elevated risk of getting Parkinson's. So do you want to talk a little bit about this as a kind of model uh, for different possible sources of inflammation in Parkinson's? Well, obviously, I'm not an expert in, in the area. I'm, I'm a dietitian with, with Parkinson's, but I also happen to have celiac disease as well. So I have an interest. I suppose I started a question of what, you know, what, you know, as, as anyone with Parkinson's does, why did this start? What was the, the trigger? And actually, I think um, a paper that you authored with uh, a Parkinson's uh, colleague of mine, Benjamin Stetcher, uh, was about triggers, facilitators, and aggravators, uh, re redefining Parkinson's disease pathogenesis. I think for me, that was, what are the questions? Like, what's the, the trigger, you know? And with um, inflammatory bowel disease, they say that, you know, people have, uh, I think it's 35%, uh, one of the papers I came across, increased risk of Parkinson's if they have inflammatory bowel disease. But those people who get the anti-inflammatory drugs, and I think you mentioned there, Roger, one of them is Imurin, um, you know, that, that basically reduces their risk, or I don't know if that it was that particular uh, anti-inflammatory drug, but there's obviously something going on there um, in terms of stopping the inflammation and reducing the, the risk. Um, and I suppose in terms of celiac disease, uh, there's been studies to show that the, there's genetic loci shared between celiac, inflammatory bowel disease, and other inflammatory conditions in Parkinson's. Um, and I think also in the HLA uh, gene around uh, celiac disease, that they're finding s is some kind of context for Parkinson's in that as well. So um, I suppose the question is, you know, from my point of view as a person with Parkinson's, if, if I had like with celiac disease, it it's, has the iceberg effect as well. You often have it for 10 years or more before the symptoms appear, it's similar with Parkinson's. So if we can get in earlier, so if I had been told earlier, you have a risk, what could be done then to basically slow down the disability of the motor symptoms later on? So sorry. But, no, no, but I was just going to interrupt again uh, because I think it ties into what you just said. So the people who received, for example, TNF alpha antibodies who had inflammatory bowel disease, got this medication, their risk for Parkinson's is not elevated, at least not as much as those who didn't. So I guess what we're all thinking is that if we knew who those people were who 
were destined to get Parkinson's, perhaps we could treat them at a much earlier stage than when they had the motor symptoms. Yeah. And we'd be treating the inflammation and slowing this progression to motor symptoms. Yeah, because I mean, ultimately, that's what a person with Parkinson's wants. I mean, obviously, we all want the cure. But if I could stop Parkinson's now and know that it wasn't going to progress anymore, well, that would be a, a big winner. And obviously, if you get in at the prodromal phrase, that would be you know amazing. And I suppose one thing, and I know it's a, 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 a sort of case study of one, which is not you know ideal, but in my own background, in terms of prior to, to, to basically self-diagnosing or realizing that I had celiac disease, um, I had very elevated uh, TH1 to TH2 markers through a, a blood test uh, group I got called the Chicago Bloods and elevated uh, natural killer cells. And uh, I kept on asking, why, why are these raised? And you know, people are just dismissive and we don't know why they are. But if we actually looked at those early on, well, you know, there's so much that we don't know about those immune cells that are telling us things that maybe we're not looking at earlier in the process, um, you know, so even going back to young, you know, very young people, I mean, Parkinson's can be 40 years, I'm 50 now, I could have had it much younger, I, I don't know. So I do think we're missing something by not looking at those uh, immunological markers earlier. That's my gut feeling to want for a better expression. <laughs> <laughs> so the interesting picture that's emerging is an association between inflammation in the bowel and Parkinson's disease an association between the genetic factors that are linked to Parkinson's and those that are linked to inflammatory bowel disease, and then evidence that if one treats inflammatory bowel disease, the risk for Parkinson's is, is mitigated somewhat. So really fascinating. We got a question from one of the uh, listeners. Actually, he is a scientist, Siv Ganor, who is a genetic ex genetics expert and Parkinson expert from Canada, asks the question, does alpha-synuclein have a role in the immune system? And uh, I think that's a good question to take in this context. So everybody, I think, knows that alpha-synuclein is a major part of the Lewy bodies, which is an integral part of the uh, pathology in Parkinson's disease. In almost all cases, there are these intracellular aggregates in the brain. Uh, does anybody want to have a shot at that question? Does synuclein have a role possibly in the immune system? And what does synuclein do in the gut? Well, I was just going to say something related to that, which has been one of the questions about what do all these proteins actually do normally. So, of course, alpha synuclein has a role in how nerve cells normally communicate. Uh, and probably Ashley knows more about this than, than myself. But there's been quite a lot of interest in a protein which is related not to Parkinson's disease, but Alzheimer's disease called amyloid, which is secreted by cells and causes pathology and leads to Alzheimer's disease. And then the question is, well, if it's secreted and causes Alzheimer's disease, obviously nature didn't put it there to secrete and develop Alzheimer's disease. It's there for a purpose. So one of the hypotheses is it's secreted to trap bugs and to stop infections getting into the brain. So one of the questions is, do some of these other proteins as well? And I don't know whether this has been shown for alpha-synuclein or, or postulated, but do these proteins themselves have some immune function in helping the brain keep healthy by binding to things that it shouldn't do? Now, I don't know the case for alpha-synuclein, but another protein, as I say, amyloid, which is uh, linked uh, to Alzheimer's disease. And to some extent, you see it in Parkinsonian brains may have a role in that function. So of course, if that is true and you remove all these proteins as your disease modifying therapy, you may open people up to other problems. Uh, and there is a paper out there that uh, describes an upregulation of synuclein in gut in conjunction with a viral infection in the gut. It's, it's a small study, thought provoking. Want Yes, go ahead, actually. expand a little bit on the, the question about alpha-synuclein and having a role in the immune system. And I think that that is definitely something that is a hot topic of research. So um, I don't know that it specifically has a role in immune cells, but we know from a lot of research that we've done as well as others that uh, alpha-synuclein activates immune cells. And in the case of Parkinson's, we know that different pieces of the alpha-synuclein peptide can activate T cells directly to produce these chemical messengers that are thought to be damaging to neurons, particularly in the brain. So I think that there's definitely a role for alpha-synuclein in activating the immune system, but in terms of regulation of immune cell function, we're, it's, it's still under, like we're still researching kind of what it does. So I just want to tie into another question now uh, that came up. Somebody asks, what do we think the influences of extracellular vesicles 
either come from the brain or from the blood in the context of inflammation. So just to give a background, we learned some 10, 15 years ago, perhaps that cells would secrete these tiny vesicles, they're usually called exosomes, and they can carry messenger molecules. We don't fully understand what those molecules do, but there is a paper or a few papers in Parkinson's disease suggesting that one can measure molecules in these exosomes that are circulating in blood and assay them and that will reflect what's going on in the brain. Does anybody want to say anything about that uh, in, in conjunction with inflammation? Well, I suppose, uh, I mean, I think it's, uh, I mean, I've been part of one of those papers with uh, uh, my colleague Francesca Cicchetti in Canada, where we looked at exosomal extracellular vesicles in the, in the blood. I think the difficulty is knowing quite where those vesicles originate from. So what cells are they coming from? And if they do come from peripheral cells in the circulation, which cells those are and how does that relate to inflammation in the brain? So I think whether they're a useful marker for Parkinson's disease and a way of assessing inflammation is a little unclear. Certainly people have taken this therapeutically. So some of the stem cells, which I know has been the, the source of a uh, topic of another webinar, some people have used uh, certain types of stem cells and used them on the basis that they produce anti-inflammatory exosomal vesicles, which then damp down inflammation. So this has perhaps gained greatest traction in terms of multiple sclerosis, which is a well-defined disease of autoimmunity, where people attack the insulation on their nerves in their brains, and people have used stem cells releasing exosomes there as a way of reducing inflammation. But I think in Parkinson's disease, the evidence that circulating exosomes really tell us anything that's going on in the brain, I think is still unproven, I would say. But there was a study involving one of your British colleagues in the American group where they used a marker that they could find on those exosomes and, mm. and thereby said, these probably come from the brain and now we're gonna measure what's inside of them. And they, they got some very interesting results in relation to another type of study we're looking at uh, a therapeutic agent. Do you think this might be something we'll be doing in the future in Parkinson's? So we get a window into the brain, into the inflammatory responses in the brain by looking at exosomes that come from the brain. I definitely think that's that's going to that's going to be a very uh, an emerging area. So I think uh, you know the idea uh, in the past that the brain was rather isolated from the immune system and did its own thing. Uh, as we've said, this whole idea has changed. Uh, in particular, the idea that the the brain can now talk directly into the immune system and the immune system talk directly to it. Therefore, the circulation and the brain are much more intimately related than I think people used to think they were. They thought they were rather isolated. So it would not be surprising that things found in the circulation have in some ways a brain origin. I suppose what I was saying is I think the evidence so far that you can look at markers in the blood as indicators either of diagnosing Parkinson's disease, uh, tracking disease progress, or telling you something about inflammation are unproven it's not to say that they they won't be proven but i don't think there's anything there so I, so you know i get asked a lot if, if i can have a blood test to show i've got parkinson's disease and i would love to say there is but but there isn't but i do think this is a very uh an area where i think refined technologies are telling us a lot more which might be useful so thank you we have a question now regarding diet it was actually a topic we wanted to come to uh, is there any evidence that there there might be diets that could reduce inflammation in Parkinson's disease and thereby potentially affect disease progression or reduce the risk of getting the disease. And I thought, Rochelle, maybe being a dietitian, perhaps you want to start this one off. It's a difficult question. That's a big question. Um, and I think the answer is that the research is, is actually um, lacking in the area. I think it's, it's, it's growing in the area, but um, I think there's very many different uh, angles to it and I think coming back to the point of there's so many different subsets of people with Parkinson's that you know one has to be careful about kind of giving a, a sort of a, a catch-all uh, solution um, I mean I think the safest advice at the moment would be that the Mediterranean diet seems to be the one that a shows the best uh, you know evidence so far in terms of reducing risk of getting Parkinson's tell us what it is you know we all talk <laughs> about the Mediterranean, Mediterranean diet. diet so I mean in essence it basically is um, you know in terms of a, a diet that's very high in, in fruit and vegetables for one um, and it's also high in omega-3 fish oily fish it also is high in olive oil 
um, as well in terms of the monounsaturated fats. It's high in terms of nuts as well as another form of monounsaturated fat. So these fats basically have an anti-inflammatory uh, action in the body. So that's probably what's you know helping to sort of drive that. Um, so, interesting. So to remember the Mediterranean diet, you just have to think of things that kids don't like to eat. Yes, that's yeah, yeah. Um, but actually, there's a lot of research in terms food. of. There's a lot of research in the neuropsychiatry, the nutritional psychiatry area with regard to around depression and, you know, major mm -hmm. depression in relation to the Mediterranean diet. And it's very strong. And a lot of the underlying sort of science behind it is quite similar in terms of the effects of Parkinson's. And obviously we can't forget the prodromal feature uh, of Parkinson's a lot of the time is, is mental disease health, you know, in terms of conditions. Uh, but I suppose one of the things I want to say is I think where the effect of the Mediterranean diet through the the rich fiber in the diet is possibly, and that was similarly came through when I attended a nutritional psychiatry conference, um, in terms of the effect it's having on the, the microbiome, which I think is a really big part of this whole inflammation discussion. Um, and in fact, I took part in a study myself in the King's College London, looking at uh, you know, the whole microbiome and looking at you know, small intestinal bowel overgrowth and also laxatives in relation to symptoms. And it's not just the drug effect in terms of the stopping, you know, improving levodopa, but it's actually altering the, the, the dysbiosis and the inflammation in the gut that the microbes are causing. So that's something that's- So, so two difficult words there, microbiome and dysbiosis. Tell everybody who's listening, what does that really mean? Well, I suppose the microbiome is basically, you know, uh, what your, I suppose it's like your planet of, of microbes that are in your gut and it's made up of, you know, what we call good and bad uh, bacteria. And there is, uh, research to show that people with Parkinson's tend to have an overgrowth, uh, so small intestinal bowel overgrowth, where they have propensity to have overgrowth of maybe the less uh, healthy um, microbes. Um, and also a lot of the research in the WPC Congress, which I specifically went to hear, uh, was about how people with Parkinson's have higher levels of uh, bifidobacteria and lower levels of Prevotella. And these are associated with short chain fatty acids uh, in terms of lack of them and those short chain fatty acids are supposed to have an anti-inflammatory effect in the bowel so you know there's so much that we need to kind of uh, tease out there so in terms of that catch-all mediterranean diet what are the actual you know constituent parts that are are having that potential anti-inflammatory effect and i think there needs to be a lot more so specific work done on that it's interesting, the question about the diet actually came from Karen Raphael, who was a panel member at the last webinar. And the first part of your answer was almost identical to what Karen said regarding exercise and Parkinson's, which is it probably is very important, but we don't have all the scientific proof yet. And I think it's true for, for diet too. Where there's good reasons to believe that one might be able to affect the course of the disease or the risk of the disease but the evidence just isn't quite there yet. Well-being, however, you know, from day to day symptoms, you could imagine that diet could have profound effects in Parkinson's because depression is, as we all know, a common occurrence in Parkinson's. And there's no doubt, I think, that diet can impact depression. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I say that's what they're finding with regard to um, the, the, quite a lot of detailed research in the Mediterranean diet and the effect. But I think that whole element of constipation and you know, those symptoms in, in people with Parkinson's, again, going back to how do we get in earlier. Um, you know, so this uh, one particular paper I came across looked at the use of laxatives in helping to reduce rigidity in people with Parkinson's. Um, and they showed that it, it was having an effect and they're theorizing is it's not just to say the improving, uh, improvement in the absorption of levodopa, but actually is it helping the anti-inflammatory effect of, you know, so there is, you know, I think a lot more that, that should be looked at there. I don't know if other people on the panel would agree or not. So James Parkinson actually described constipation very briefly in his original essay on the shaking palsy. And then it took us over 185 years to appreciate that non-motor symptoms are important again. So sometimes one has to read the original papers very carefully. We had about 10 or 11 more questions come in. And I'm going to fire off another one here uh, that is a little bit related again to, to Rochelle, I think. So maybe you could start. Uh, what do you feel about the reported association between dairy products and 
Parkinson's? Is this a reliable type of study or are there confounders yeah. that we're missing? There's, I think, you know, you'd almost need a webinar on diet on its own in terms of these topics. But um, I think in terms of dairy, I'm on the fence about this one because I think the research is not strong enough. Um, the World Cancer Research Fund came out there quite strongly recently saying this, there's nothing to show that dairy has an impact in terms of cancer. Um, Similarly, in terms of Parkinson's, uh, there's a number of confounders in terms of, you know, um, toxins in terms. So, you know, for example, dairy in Ireland would be considered, you know, to be, you know, as close as organic as you can get, which is different to American, you know, produced uh, dairy, for example, in, in, in terms of maybe, you know, chemicals that are getting in there. I don't know. Um, you've, they, they link it to urate levels. So people, you know, if you have higher urate, then it's a lower risk of PD. And is that what's having the effect? Uh, so I, I, I really feel it's, we have to be very careful because a lot of people with Parkinson's give up dairy, but dairy is very important in terms of, you know, bone health, it's very important in, in terms of other micronutrients in the diet. A lot of people with Parkinson's are underweight, don't have muscle. So again, it's not as simple as just cut out dairy is my kind of personal view on it. And I think the evidence shows the moment it's equivocal, like there's not enough evidence to say, you have to give up dairy. That's my current position on it. That might change as the the evidence uh, kind of evolves. I don't know if anybody else has uh, an opinion on that. We're well, just no nodding heads. <laughs> I think it is a very difficult question. It came from Siv Ganor. Now I'm going to jump to a question from somebody called Darlene McKenzie. And uh, maybe Ashley, you want to have a go at this one. It is very well worded question. Is Parkinson's disease an autoimmune disease? Ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> that's something that we discuss and debate all the time. Um, I think people are cautious to call it an autoimmune disease because usually an autoimmune disease kind of, well, there's definitely inflammation as we kind of discussed earlier, but I think we're seeing a lot of inflammation in both patient samples as well as in animal models. So I think that calling it an autoimmune disease may be a bit premature, although this is all what we're thinking, kind of hitting on some of the research topics that we've previously discussed about, you know, the involvement of T cells, as well as the production of uh, autoantibodies from B cells that respond to alpha-synuclein. So I think at this, at this stage, we probably wouldn't refer to it as an autoimmune disease per se, but maybe an autoinflammatory disease, maybe something that we are looking towards. So I think that the research is lacking on truly kind of knowing what is activating the immune system and also kind of looking at each individual patient since Parkinson's disease is a very heterogeneous disease, like there's not... not two cases that look alike. So I think it, it's really difficult to put a, that term on it at this stage, but it's definitely something that's really heavily under consideration. Another question, thank you, that's a really good answer because I think it's a very difficult question, but another one that it, it is fascinating, it's Siv Ganor, he's on a roll, he's getting a lot of his questions through here, but he, he asked, how do we know that the neuroinflammation that we see in Parkinson's is damaging rather than protective? I'm assuming you want me to handle this one. You can start <laughs> and see if anybody else can figure out a smart answer to that. That's a difficult one. It's a very difficult one because it's very difficult to rectify what we see in animal models versus human patients. So since obviously the immune system from a mouse or a rat or a monkey is very quite different from that of a human, um, we, we tend to think about, you know, what, what we're looking at in terms of, of how to, to really answer that question. So I think that um, it, it's definitely something that we're thinking about in terms of research. So. And Roger, do you want to add something? I see yeah. you. Well, I was, I was very impressed by the question about the uh, autoimmune disease, because I would just like to flag up that in 1988, uh, I wrote a paper entitled Parkinson's disease and autoimmune process uh, when I was uh, doing no research whatsoever it was many a thought that I had but anyway coming back I, I have to interrupt there Roger those of you who don't know you you wrote a lot of papers about things you weren't working on in those days right. and still do often refer to them today and I think that's wonderful 
<laughs> yeah, my best work was when I didn't do any research. Yeah, um, you, you were not inhibited by data. You could just speculate. No, no. I, I take a very Trump-esque view on this. Um, <laughs> so uh, in terms of that, the question, I, I think this is a very tricky one because the difficulty with any of these type of works on inflammation is in the preclinical space, one has beautiful control over the system. So you can look at rats and mice and you can look at monkeys and you can see their response to the protein alpha-synuclein or if they've got a genetic form of Parkinson's disease. But as Ashley says, the immune systems of these animals are rather different to the immune system of humans and the diseases which you're inducing in those animals are not Parkinson's disease. They're either putting in a protein or you're changing something in some other way. So ultimately, I think the only way you will actually know whether the immune responses are good or bad is actually by intervening in patients uh, in the ways that we've sort of intimated with some of the comments that we've been discussing, really. And so in some ways, coming back to the question you asked me earlier about the trial that Caroline's doing in azathioprine, that came about through conversations we had about how much do we do in mice and rats and how much do we say if we want to find an effect, probably we are actually going to have to do uh, uh, trials in patients to actually see whether we make a difference for good or for bad. Obviously, we think it's for good, but we may be surprised and fine in answer to the question. Actually, we've made things worse, which will tell us something uh, that will be important and which we can then work on, I think, in terms of answering this question. I absolutely agree. I think that, you know, we've done a lot of research in these rodent models and in targeting these immune pathways. Um, have been neuroprotective, which is quite interesting, but I think a lot of the, the models that we use are not really incorporating the entire, like the periphery as well as the central nervous system. So I think that it's difficult to really understand if, if, if you target the immune system and try to dampen its response, would that have detrimental effects in other areas that you may need your immune system to to respond to so i think that you know doing some of these studies in in patients if possible would be um, a definitely a great support to that which we've seen in in the animal models of parkinson's and i think if you also look at other diseases it's been very important so here in cambridge they did a lot of work on ms which i mentioned earlier and the very early studies they did here where they were targeting the immune system in MS didn't work. They got absolutely no benefits whatsoever, the patients. But from that, they understood actually that they targeted the wrong stage of disease and possibly the wrong type of patient. So they went back and modified what they did. And now that therapy is a licensed treatment for MS. It took 20 years to get there, which may be you know, a long time in people's thinking. But actually, these type of trials can throw up results which enable you then to move to the next stage and understand more when you're planning future interventions. So great answers to very complicated questions. I want to ask a question now that has come from two people, really. Somebody called anonymous attendee, uh, talking about aging and the immune system, if this somehow can confound our studies, but also from Galina Limorenko, she asks, what is the contribution of senescence phenotype of microglia specifically for Parkinson's? And we should explain senescence is cellular aging. And do microglia, these immune cells in the brain, do they exhibit high rates of cellular aging? And do they release something called senescence associated molecules, abbreviated SASP? So this is an area I can I say from uh, my own reading, there isn't a lot of work done, but maybe somebody has some ideas about microglia and aging. We know that aging is the single greatest risk factor for Parkinson's disease. Ashley. I think I could probably answer a few of these questions and you are indeed correct. There is absolutely very little research done in Parkinson's in terms of identifying senescent cells. We do know in the brain, microglia are the innate immune responders that clear dead, dying cells and debris, as well as excessive proteins such as alpha-synuclein. Um, we do know that they are long-lived, so these cells do not turn over in terms of proliferate. So we know that once you're born, the number of neurons that you have, with the exception of the areas of neurogenesis in the brain, are the, the, the defining number of cells that you have, and as they die off, you uh, end up with these disease symptoms. Microglia can proliferate, they can um, activate, and they can replace themselves as they die and age, but we do know in the brain 
and particularly in neurodegenerative disorders, that microglia are long lived and that, you know, that perhaps they may proliferate, but I think that there's a huge idea of this idea of these cells becoming senescent. So this idea of inflammaging, which is, you know, kind of combining inflammation and aging, how these immune cells respond with age is that they have seen a lot of these antigens and damaged proteins that have activated them over time, making them less sensitive to perhaps something that is really important, such as recognizing alpha synuclein or recognizing these inflammatory responses and having the ability to shut down the inflammation. So I think that age definitely has a huge impact on not only the number of cells that can respond, but also the response of these particular immune cells in the brain. I think that's a great answer. One might interject that it's very hard to study this in the laboratory. It's very difficult and expensive to maintain aged animals and do studies. And, and microglia are notoriously difficult to grow in cell culture dishes without them changing their properties the minute you take them out of the brain. So oh, absolutely. We get questions about that all the time. Our animal models, we tend, you know, when we are doing research, we tend to use younger animals since you mm. don't have to, to keep them alive for long periods of time. So I think that, you know, looking at senescence in terms of the immune cells and how age affects these uh, animal models is, is definitely a hot area of research. So uh, I'm going to switch gears again. I'm going to go back to the gut. We have a question related to how one would assess a therapeutic agent in people with inflammatory bowel disease and the challenges that this would pose. But before we get there, I'm going to ask a more general question. How does the gut and how do the gut and brain communicate with each other? Maybe, Roger, you want to have a shot at this. There might be a couple of routes. Yes, I mean, uh, the most obvious Root is obvious. Well, there are two major routes, I would guess. You know, you absorb things through your gut and they can get into the circulation and uh, that circulation can get into your brain. So that would be one route by which you could have issues or changes in the gut affecting the brain. And so people have been interested in whether things such as absorption and the ability, permeability of the gut to absorb things is slightly different in Parkinson's, different things cross over and therefore the brain is communicating, uh, the gut is communicating to the brain via the circulation. The other area where I think probably most of the work has been done, but I'm sure others will correct me on this, is the idea that the nerves, obviously the gut has an enormous nervous system. So some people talk about it as a second brain. It has many, many nerve cells in there, huge numbers, and they're very uh, tightly organized. And obviously in order for them to work properly, whilst they have their own capacity to work locally, they need to be controlled by the brain. So they have communications with the brain. Uh, both into the brain and out of the brain. And the big nerve that does that is called the vagus nerve, uh, which actually innovates all sorts of things. So it innovates your lungs, it innovates your heart. Uh, and so this is a nerve which communicates uh, with your gut and your gut communicates with your brain through it. And it, it comes into the brain at the bottom of the brain, uh, the very uh, bit of the brain just above the spinal cord, a thing called the medulla. And that uh, is one of the areas where you get early pathology in Parkinson's. So people have been very interested in the idea that a problem in the gut communicates to the brain via that nerve, enters the brain through that site as well as through the nose, and from there the disease passes through. So uh, there's a lot of evidence, there's a lot of interest in that, and there is some epidemiological evidence uh, from big studies where people have had their vagus nerve cut. Uh, which used to be a treatment in the old days, even before I started practicing medicine, to get rid of ulcers. So we didn't have all the drugs that we have nowadays, the cimetidine, the rincidine, and all of those type of drugs. So they used to cut the vagus nerve to stop the acid secretion in the stomach. And in some studies, if you cut, completely cut the vagus nerve, which obviously stops the communication between the gut and the brain, there's a reduced instance of Parkinson's disease in that population. So that infers that, 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 that perhaps the vagus nerve is in some way important in mediating Parkinson's disease. Of course, the other argument is people who get ulcers and need their vagus cut are the very people who genetically aren't predisposed to get Parkinson's. That's why they have less Parkinson's in that group. So it's nothing to do with cutting the vagus nerve. It's just there are different types of patients. But those are the two sort of main areas, circulation. But the vagus nerve has been an area of huge interest in how the disease may start in the gut and spread to the brain and how the brain how the gut communicates with the brain. So now that we're back in the gut and the idea that uh, antibodies to TNF-alpha can help people with inflammatory bowel disease, uh, 
if we were going to test if they could help people with Parkinson's, the question is here, how many people would you need to test this theory with? And we know that this is a complicated question, so we're not going to put you on the spot, Roger, but we know that the odds risk ratio for people with inflammatory bowel disease to get Parkinson's, it's significantly elevated, but of course, still 96, 97% of people with inflammatory bowel disease don't get Parkinson's. So would you take many thousand people with inflammatory bowel disease and put some on TNF-alpha antibodies, which you do anyway today, yeah. so that's sort of epidemiology, or what's the approach? Tell me, what, what's your yeah, thinking? I think it's extremely difficult. I mean, there is some interesting data out there, one of which is a published paper that I know of, and one is, again, work that Caroline's done, where they've done um, huge, uh, they've done a look at a huge number of health records, so millions of health records, and they've looked at people who are taking powerful immunosuppressive drugs, not just for inflammatory bowel disease, but for anything. So psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis. And if you look at the risk of getting Parkinson's in people who are on major immunosuppressive therapies, it's reduced. So that's been done in, a, I think, in a big an American study and in the GP records, which Caroline's looked at here, which is millions of patients, there is a reduced risk in people who take those drugs. So I think if you're gonna prove that there's a link, you're gonna to have to probably do it in a very large population of patients. I think trying to prove it in Parkinson's disease and inflammatory bowel disease is extremely difficult because obviously if you have people with inflammatory bowel disease, you are going to have to treat them with something. You can't sort of mm -hmm. say, well, I'm going to give you placebo and I'm going to give you a major immune therapy mm -hmm. and we'll see how things go and we'll wait 10 or 20 years and see who develops Parkinson's disease and who doesn't. So I think... So the trial is impossible at the outset. Yeah. So I think you're going to have to do epidemiological studies uh, to uh, really get some handle on that. And then ultimately, I think you will have to use the anti-inflammatory agent you're using in that particular condition in people with Parkinson's. And that obviously raises, uh, you know, um, ethical issues, if you like, because you're going to use quite expensive, powerful drugs which have side effects in people with Parkinson's. And as we've already sort of suggested, it's quite difficult to monitor progression in Parkinson's. It's quite difficult to know whether you're disease modifying. You can certainly see whether you've had an effect on the immune system but have you really slowed down the disease process and how do we assess that? So to me, the future is that if you think you've got a good agent, you are going to have to do a trial and you're going to have to follow people for quite some time. But Ashley, do you think there are other ways to target TNF-alpha? And I suspect you can have an answer. Well, I guess I was going to comment kind of what Roger was saying is that, you know, this really kind of is related, but not necessarily answering the question about TNF-alpha specifically is kind of this lack of a, a biomarker in Parkinson's that would identify, particularly an inflammatory biomarker that would identify these particular patients that have an autoimmune disorder such as IBD that would put them at risk for developing Parkinson's. So um, I, I think that that's sort of where the research is lacking is really kind of could we look in uh, blood or stool to find some type of inflammatory biomarker that would identify these particular patients are at risk for developing Parkinson's and could you follow them over time to see kind of how the progression occurs and whether or not they would be a good target for uh, anti-TNF antibodies. So I think that, you know, anti-TNF antibodies have their own risks. There's a lot of side effects as TNF is extremely important for fighting infection. So long-term treatment of people on these immune suppressing drugs may not be like a great idea, but something that, you know, you could use in combination with other therapeutics. Like I know people are looking at antibodies to reduce alpha-synuclein, um, you know, so perhaps a combinatorial approach or the identification of a biomarker that could be tracked over time that would, that would definitely um, identify populations of patients that would benefit from uh, immune therapy. So, so this is a great topic, biomarkers and inflammatory responses. Now, there are several studies that indicate that people who already have Parkinson's, as opposed to those at risk, they will have changes in their inflammatory profile. You described that 50 minutes ago, actually, very <laughs> elegantly. But what's also been described is that some of these people uh, have more non-motor symptoms. So the ones with more inflammation seem to be more prone to uh, depression, for example. Uh, is that another way forward in testing the idea that inflammation is important in Parkinson's? Not just going down the a uh, way of looking for ways to slow disease progression, but actually to treat the symptoms by reducing inflammation and then specifically looking at non-motor symptoms. 
I think so. I think that this is definitely something that could be looked at. And I know that Roger could probably talk about this a little bit, you know, Caroline Williams Gray's work has shown that, you know, inflammation, targeting inflammation early in disease course ha can have drastic effects on the rate of progression, but really kind of understanding how inflammation contributes to progression is something that, you know, is actively under research, under research and something that we definitely want to look at. So. I also just sh should say somebody made a comment here, Reza Gielma said that many of the studies where they've looked at inflammatory markers in the serum in both Parkinson's and Alzheimer didn't take into account the many confounding factors, you know, infection, smoking, depression, sleep, et cetera. And that is true, because these are very, very challenging studies. I know that some of the studies have looked at these confounders to the best of their ability. Uh, so very difficult area of research to conduct. Um, we just have about four and a half minutes to go. And I thought maybe I could bring in you, Rochelle, because there's a specific question, again, related to what we just talked about from uh, a patient who says, what would you recommend patients to do in their daily lives to reduce inflammation? And here I'm presuming lifestyle factors. Do you concur with the findings that suggest that intermittent fasting and exercise could assist in reducing inflammation and the last part is thereby slow progression, but I think we could modify the question and say, make patients feel better symptomatically as well as potentially slow progression. <laughs> That's Difficult a big question, ask. Rochelle. You have three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think in terms of, you know, I've already covered in terms of from a diet point of view, I definitely think if people, uh, you know, follow this sort of Mediterranean diet sort of principles that I've outlined already in the, in the webinar, I think that would, would be huge. I think if people hydrate well, they get, you know, keep their bowels uh, healthy in terms of fiber, um, you know, discuss with their, their uh, consultant and their GP if they're not moving, because an awful lot, I think it's something like, a study in WPC showed that about 30% of people with Parkinson's actually said they had constipation, but when they actually did scans on them, 90% of the people actually had, mm -hmm. had constipation. So a lot of people don't realize that they're constipated, and that has huge implications on a number of levels in terms of um, your health and potentially for the research inflammation in the gut. Um, in terms of intermittent fasting, I think the jury is out on that. Uh, I would question, is the intermittent fasting doing something to the microbiome there? Is that what's going on? And I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, just again, going back to the point of a lot of people with Parkinson's are um, what they call, um, you know, have muscle wasting as it is. And if you go and do intermittent fasting, that could have effects. And then in, in terms of exercise, we'll look without a shadow of a doubt, uh, one of the only things that's showing at the moment sort of uh, serious impact on symptoms um, is exercise and doing intense exercise uh, and high intensity intense exercise. Um, in terms of it reducing inflammation, there probably is, you know, research, but I'm not an exercise uh, scientist, but I think it's showing that it probably does have an impact on inflammation. So I think, you know, realism is yes, without a shout of a doubt, any of us with Parkinson's should be doing high intensity uh, exercise um, to help our, our symptoms and the, the evidence isn't there for slowing progression yet, but I think Blas Blum is working very hard to, to try and see mm -hmm. their next set of research, uh, what comes out of that. Um, so I hope that answers the question in three minutes. <laughs> I think you did very well. And those who, who want to hear even more about it, I, I suggest you go to the YouTube page and you can listen to a whole hour of exercise and Parkinson's disease. And then in relation to the question about, for example, sleep, uh, there's also an hour about sleep and Parkinson's disease. So you can hear what people think about the possibility that sleep has symptomatic benefit or potentially could modify disease progression is discussed with another group of panelists. So with this group, I'd just like to thank you all. We are at the end of the one hour. These hours always fly by so quickly and I learn a lot and I enjoy hearing all the answers and reading all the questions. We still have at least five or six questions we didn't answer. We'll do our best to write those answers and distribute them. And we will also post this webinar on the YouTube page so you can listen to it over and over again. Who wouldn't want to hear this panel several times? You've done great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Rochelle.
thank you, Ashley, and thank you, Roger. And with that, I'd like to say bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Thank you.